May Day, the Handmaid's Tale podcast is brought to you by Fan Mail. Buy monthly subscription box by Lady Geeks for Lady Geeks. You can find more information about Fan Mail at myfanmail.com. You can also use the promo code MAYDAY to get 10% off your first box right now. Also brought to you by Mine, a comics collection to benefit Planned Parenthood. Support Planned Parenthood with comics by Neil Gaiman, Gabby Rivera, Amber Benson, Gerard Way, Yona Harvey, Mara Wilson, Kelsey Herx, and more. Uh, you can go to the Kickstarter page. If you go to comicmix.com and scroll down, it'll be right there on the right-hand side. You'll see the link or go to their uh, Twitter page, at Comic Mix, and you can find it. And also brought to you by Nina Diaz, a fantastic singer, songwriter, lead singer of the band Girl in a Coma. She is touring right now with her band, uh, touring on her solo album called The Beat is Dead. You can find information about her at ninadiazmusic.com and follow her on Twitter at at ninadiazmusic. So check her out. Uh, fantastic voice, fantastic artist. Once again, ninadiazmusic.com. Hello and welcome. This is Justin, Mayday the Handmaid's Tale podcast. I am joined today by friend of the show, frequent contributor Delia Harrington. Uh, she is here to talk about Title IX and uh, some guidance that was rescinded today by Betsy DeVos, the Education Secretary for the United States. And we wanted to talk to her to see what all that was about and what that meant uh, for everyone on college campuses. So Delia, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. So let's go ahead and explain exactly what Title IX, the Title IX guidance was and what happened today. So most people, when they think about Title IX, they think about uh, girls and women being able to play sports. Um, But more recently, the last five or so years, um, and basically since Obama was in office, that was when people started to think about it more in terms of sexual assault and particularly sexual assault on college campuses. Um, And what happened today is that, as you mentioned, Secretary DeVos um, had the rescinding of um, basically what we knew as the President Obama era um, policies that we thought of as the Title IX policies. We had a warning maybe uh, not too long ago, uh, a speech that she made on a college campus basically saying that something was coming. But I think a lot of advocates um, thought that we would have a little bit more time and that we might have a chance to comment before this rescinding happened. Um, But that was not the case. A lot of people are really unclear as to what's going to happen next. Um, And there's also going to be, um, as part of that, there was also a press release. And then there's also this idea that there will be sort of this period of public comment and that more will be coming. Right. I didn't um, see that, the, that they're going to take comment. And I didn't really know what that meant because I had not really heard that phrase that way before from a government official. There's so many different sets of these um, letters and statements that have been made over the years within Title IX, so many different policies. But I think in 2001, there was a set of policies that came out and those were made after a period of public comment. And so this idea was that these the a new, another one will come out after a period of public comment and honestly the way it read it was definitely a little bit of shade at obama because it was phrased immediately after you know when this dear colleague letter which i'll talk about in a second this dear colleague letter came from the obama administration and it was like the dear colleague letter did not come after a period of public comment my letter will come after a period of public comment uh, and of course this letter didn't come directly from um, betsy devos but it came down from her from her folks uh, so mm-hmm. let's talk about the Obama guidance initially. So let's talk about what that actually did, because I was kind of it's interesting because it basically gave some colleges guidance as to how they were to view the evidence of these cases. But it didn't yeah, so, actually put in any new laws. These were already laws that were our guidance that was already in place. Is that, Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so it's known as the Dear Colleague Letter, um, which is also fascinating because all of these letters basically start with the words Dear Colleague, but this one is the Dear Colleague Letter, if you hear people call it that. And if you're on Twitter, a lot of people are referring to it as DCL um, because there's so many tweets going on now about so many different policies that we're abbreviating this thing now. Um, And it really outlines um, how universities should handle sexual assault allegations. Um, And so this was the beginning of putting into action, framing how universities, just the idea that students are entitled to their education um, and that a sexual assault complaint and sexual assault was was interfering with that. Um, I think that that hadn't really been framed that way in the past. And the idea that universities 
were required to ensure that if, you know, a sexual assault had taken place, um, that they had to do something about that fact, um, that they had to take some sort of action um, to ensure the safety of the student, to um, ensure their well-being, and to inform some sort of punishment on on the student who was in the wrong. So it had things like um, a major one was limiting the length of time that this adjudication could go on. And that's really huge because um, basically you could you, you could wait it out. Um, if somebody was accused of sexual assault, they could just wait until they graduated, which is what a lot of universities were doing, whether it was intentional or not. Um, and there's a lot of money involved, there's a lot of PR involved, and there was a lot of cases, if you watch a movie like a documentary like The Hunting Ground, if this was a prominent, um, if the accused was a prominent person, whether an athlete or you know someone who was related to a major donor, the school had a vested interest in making sure that this person did not get, um, you know, did not get found responsible, and also that these accusations never sort of came to the forefront, that you didn't have prospective students hearing about them. Um, another one discouraging um, cross-examination of the accusers and discouraging any sort of face-to-face -face mediation, a big thing that schools used to do would be to have and talk it out in the same way that you would like have two roommates who don't get along, who've like done the duct tape down the middle of the room thing, sit down and talk out their problems. But doing that with, you know, a perpetrator of sexual violence and someone who they have harmed. Um, so, you know, it's one thing if you're talking about people who are disagreeing about toilet paper, but if you're talking about someone who potentially has, has hurt someone in an incredibly deep and violent way, um, that's just, that's so traumatic and that's so harmful. Um, and that's really something that, that if you talk to any advocate of, of, you know, for victims and survivors of sexual violence, they, they would never recommend that. Um, and for the people that I've spoken to who have been put in that position where they were, you know, their school made them do that, or they were advised to do that. It was something that was really deeply upsetting and traumatic for them. One of the big things that the Dear Colleague letter did was made sure to let the colleges know that they were to use the preponderance of evidence standard. Is that correct? When they were... Yes. Let's talk about what that means, because I know that's one of the major things here. So this is a huge one that is a, is a big sticking point um, for a lot of people, and it's one that a lot of people, I think, struggle with, even if they agree with the rest of them. Um, so there's a few different standards um, that schools have used at different times. So preponderance of the evidence is more likely than not. Um, it's something that's typically used in civil law. Um, now keep in mind, we're not talking about actual courts of law. We're talking about, you know, actual universities and schools the same way that you would go if you got in trouble because you had like, you know, filled your roommate's place with whipped cream or if you had punched someone or if you had done plagiarism, something like that. Um, so we're talking about preponderance of the evidence. That's what they recommended in the Dear Colleague letter. So more likely than not that this happened. Um, With the colleges investigating it, is when their investigation's ongoing, is it to decide whether they should be prosecuting this person or? Yeah, so this is separate from the justice system. Okay. And a lot of people use the terms of the justice system interchangeably. And sometimes they're doing that because they're confused and because they seem so similar. And sometimes people are doing that deliberately and it's really hard to know when they're when they're doing that. Right. Um, I feel very strongly that we need both of those things. On most college campuses, the only way to get the kind of accommodations that you would need, like having someone removed from your class schedule or your dorm or anything like that, which are like the typical kind of accommodations someone would need, the, only way to get those is by winning your proceedings, your okay. on-campus adjudication. This is all really more to handle it at the school level before or during the criminal investigation, if there is one. Or even regardless of what, yeah. Regardless and so it's really that. about your daily life. And so for a lot of people, the <laughs> criminal case may is less relevant to them. Right. Um, or it may not be accessible to them in any way, or it may just be something that they feel like is to stigmatizing, traumatizing, unavailable, you know, they may not trust that system, but it's like right. the daily life thing of like, 
you know, being able to just walk around and feel safe, like right. that's the thing that affects them on a daily basis. So that's the, and that's why they feel I need to feel safe. And I mean, there's a reason that colleges do this stuff. I mean, there's a reason that colleges do it when it's not sexual assault, right? Like colleges adjudicate drinking and they adjudicate punching and they adjudicate, you know, like if a student beats up another student, colleges step in and adjudicate that. So this is lower than um, what would be required in a criminal court, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the sort of the thing you've right. heard on it, law and order a lot. Uh, I believe it's uh, the clear and convincing evidence standard is the other. Option. So the that's the option that a lot of schools have been using before is clear and convincing evidence. Um, so those are sort of the three that you hear about. One is a legal standard in a criminal case. Another one is the one that a lot of schools have been using, clear and convincing. And then the other one is the one that had been recommended. Um, so that we lowered from clear and convincing down to more likely than not. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of mixed feelings on this. A lot of people. I think would prefer that it was beyond a reasonable doubt or they see clear and convincing and beyond a reasonable doubt to be um, on par with one another. You know, they see clear and convincing as being the school equivalent of beyond a reasonable doubt. I can see why people would think that. Um, personally, I feel, you know, knowing what I know about sexual violence, the likelihood that you would have the kind of evidence that would produce um, people to see to come to a clear and convincing conclusion. I just find that that's highly unlikely in general. And so that to me just seems like an unreasonable standard. Um, but I understand the motivation for that. I think living in a country that we do with the laws that we do, I, I understand why people feel that way. Um, the other thing that I see to be really compelling is that at many, at many colleges and universities, um, their standard for other types of discipline. So if you got caught with marijuana, if you got caught with plagiarism, their standard is the preponderance of the evidence. Their standard is more likely than not. So in my mind, it shouldn't be harder to get kicked out for sexual assault than it is to get kicked out for plagiarism. That's kind of how, how I look at it. Right. The interesting thing to me, again, is that this Dear Colleague letter was not putting anything new in place it was just saying this is the standard that is already set make sure you use it that's the confusing part i think for a lot of people is that i think some people will hear this and say this letter that obama sent out was to establish this when it had already been established correct it basically said to people, we're actually going to start enforcing this. Um, so there's also a Q&A that came with this one, similar to the Q&A with the, the uh, rescinding that happened today. Um, and so what it, what it outlined there was things like, um, you can lose funding is basically the thing that started freaking people out. Um, and so people, universities, um, and there's been other pieces since the Dear Colleague letter that have come out um, that collectively make up um, the the Obama era title line as we know it. Um, but so looking at all of that stuff together, um, what we now have is that you can file, you can file a Cleary complaint, um, which basically means that, you know, you can, um, if you watch the bunch of um, students at various universities, they look through um, Title IX and they look at all of these different standards and they say, oh, my university took more than 60, that 60 day limit or my university made me sit down and, you know, face to face with my accuser or I was cross examined. And when I say cross examined, I don't mean cross examined by, um, you know, like the teacher who was running the adjudication, the professor um, asked me questions about it. I mean, the alleged perpetrator directly questioned them. Is, still, is it, that's still happening? So this was the kind of this. Uh, yes, it is still happening. But that's the kind of thing that was covered in, in the hunting ground. And that does still wow. happen. Um, and in fact, so that's one of the things that if you look at um, Betsy DeVos's speech and if you look at like um, some of the other articles that have been coming out in the last uh, couple weeks since that speech, quite a few of those examples, it's been pointed out um, by a lot of people, a lot of those examples were not in fact of people complying with the Obama era policies. They were examples of people who were in violation of the policies. It explicitly <laughs> says in the Dear Colleague letter that due process must be respected. It specifically says that anything that you give to one side, you know, if you give to the complainant, if you give to the accuser, then you must give to the accused. So a lot of these things that people are concerned about, 
these things are provided for in the Dear Colleague letter. Um, if the execution is falling short, then that's absolutely something that we need to be looking at. And I, it's absolutely something that gets talked about in my circles anyway. Um, you know, Title IX is not held up as something that's like perfect. It's something that we continually need to address and that needs to be improved upon. Um, but getting rid of it and having less protection, that's not something that, that I think anyone is interested in. So let's talk about the argument for getting rid of it, or at least the reasoning that they are giving for rescinding it. Yeah. So the idea here um, is that people feel that there's been an infringement upon the rights of the accused. They feel like the accused do not have the right to see. Some people have said they don't have the right to see all the evidence, that they don't have the right to defend themselves, that there's been too many false accusations. Um, interestingly, a lot of people have brought up that disproportionately black men and men of color have been harmed by this, um, which I think is a really, it's really astute and strategic of them to do that because they know, they know their audience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't for a second think that Donald Trump's administration, that the GOP, that Betsy DeVos particularly care about the rights of black men and men of color in, in our criminal justice system. Um, it is, of course, black men and men of color are being discriminated against in our criminal justice system. They are systematically, it was, the entire thing is designed against them. Um, there is a very specific history of men of color and black men in particular, white women being used against them and white women's virginity, their maidenhood as, um, as, it, as it was put recently in that amazing article about, about Trump's presidency being like the first white president. I thought that was such a great article by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, yep. um, and he used the phrase white, white maidenhood. And there's that, there's a history of that, of, of saying, oh, you, you looked at this white woman, you raped this white woman as a way of, of harming black men. I mean, look at, look at Emmett Till. Like this is absolutely a history in this country. And that's definitely something that we have to reckon with. Um, and I think that that's a huge thing that when I'm talking with my colleagues in the anti-sexual violence movement, that's absolutely something that, that we talk about and that we struggle with. But I don't think that the answer to that, to that discrimination, and, and I do think that that absolutely is something that happens because of the criminal justice system, um, a system that is inherently flawed and that is pur purposefully stacked against them. Um, I don't think that the answer to that is then to harm survivors of sexual violence who, as a reminder, are disproportionately women of color, particularly black women, indigenous women. Like, I don't think that it's to harm a different group. Um, I don't I don't think that that's the solution here. So let's talk about exactly what has gone away with this being rescinded. Sure. So I had mentioned that um, 60 day limit on adjudications. So that is now gone. Face to face mediation is back on the table. Uh, the idea that a person could be asked to sit down with their alleged perpetrator, that preponderance of the evidence, um, the, the standard that we talked about going back and forth um, and going back to the, the clear and convincing that higher standard or back to that. We're kind of in this holding pattern, right? Because now they've issued yeah. this temporary, temporary guidance, I guess, where they've really rescinded it, but haven't put anything in place. And so now we're just waiting yeah. to see what's coming down the pike. Yeah, we'll see what they end up putting in place. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, I was I was reading the text of her speech. Um, I couldn't bring myself to listen to it. That didn't seem like a productive use of my time. Um, and it was faster to read it anyway. And there were lots of sections of her speech that actually sounded pretty reasonable. And then every so many sentences or so, she would say something that sounded awful. In some ways, I think it will be like 75% what we have now and then 25% awful. <laughs> you know, like it'll be similar to what we have. Like some of it will just read like, oh, con control V. You know, like right. just stealing, paste. stealing someone else's homework. Right. And then just like, oh, I talked to some people, some I talked to some MRAs and they gave me these great ideas um, and they're called I'm going to make your lives suck. <laughs> you know, I just I don't know. I feel like a lot of it will probably be really similar because so much of what she has said already 
in her speech or the guidance that's been released is things like, oh, due process, great. Already had that in the Dear Colleague letter. You know, like there's so many things in there that already exist that how different can it really be? And then the few things that have been mentioned that are different are, are really different and they're really going to make in a, a qualitative difference in the lives of, of on-campus survivors that's going to really have a chilling effect. Um, they're really going to make survivors much less likely to come forward and they're going to make they're going to make people much more likely quite frankly to drop out of college um, to have behavioral health problems to have long-lasting effects um, from something that is already an incredibly difficult thing to recover from sure let's let's talk about that side of it the you know outside of college i mean obviously this mentally and you know sometimes physically doesn't end with the college experience or this you know happening in school so what are your opinions on and thoughts on how this could have potentially long-term affect everything? Yeah. So I think a big part of why the college campus version of sexual assault um, is such a hot topic for everyone is that things that happen on college campuses later on end up becoming things that are part of our fabric of our culture. Um, Like I think about take back the night and how we had take back the night before we had, you know, anti-marital rape laws, you know? And so as goes college campuses, eventually as goes our country, you think about like Vietnam war protests and then how those started on campuses and they spread to the rest of the country. Like often what happens to the youth of a country happens to the rest of the country. And I think that that's part of why it's so important for us here. Um, when you do, when you are young, and if you go to college, um, it's a sad fact that if you if you are a young woman in particular, if you go to college, you are more likely to be to be sexually assaulted uh, than if you were to not attend college. Um, and I remember learning that and just thinking, wow, if they told parents that, you know, if that was on the brochure. So you've referenced this uh, documentary. Yes, The Hunting Ground. This was by uh, Kirby Dick. I think it's a great introduction to the idea of on-campus sexual assault. Like Harvard Law School is in there and um, in some of the documentation for the the rescinded letter today um, was from Harvard Law School professors. Um, really? And they, 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 yes, they wrote a letter um, that Betsy DeVos's folks agree with. Um, saying that we should protect accused people, but they're in the hunting ground. Uh, Harvard Law School is being not so great to survivors of sexual assault. Um, and that, that just doubles back on the just the power issue, right? I mean, you're talking about one of the probably, if not the most well-known Ivy League school in the United States, knowing that someone from that college and a group of professors from that college would put their muscle behind this is a little disconcerting it certainly is it certainly is i was not surprised to see that she used that letter i I was expecting that she would there's a there's a group of professors there that have um, supported things like this for a while now and so does the data back that up so the false accusations data there it ranges the rate of false accusations is on par with the rate for other crimes and by some counts it's actually significantly lower the public consciousness generally believes that there are more um, people who cried wolf than there are they disproportionately believe that oh yeah it's like people who had sex and then you know it got confusing when that's not actually true if we look at david lisak he's a a researcher Um, he's done some of the most I find really interesting research on perpetrators. And it turns out if you, um, as long as you just don't use the R word, if you don't actually say the word rape, but if you say things like had sex with someone against their will or forced someone to have sex with you or made somebody have sex, even if they didn't want to, um, rapists will totally tell you that they are rapists um, and they'll tell you literally anything you want to know. So he's done all kinds of research on perpetrators. Um, he just, as long as he doesn't say, have you raped anybody? Um, then they'll tell him, yeah, I totally had sex with somebody who didn't want to. Um, and then they'll tell him all these other things about themselves. And so he's done this really fascinating research over the years. Um, and that's where most of the really good and interesting data about what do we actually know about this crime has come from. So I find it, if you look up David Lisak, look up his stuff, I find him really fascinating to read. But from what I'm understanding, that the protections that were in place already, there should have been no 
preferential treatment to either side, right? That's that's the idea. No one has special treatment. That would seem to be yes. logical. Okay. That's the. And I, I hate to keep coming back to that because I'm just trying to make sure I understand it because it makes me. Yeah, kind of yeah. Again, it's just so frustrating um, to think about this even having to be an issue right now. Um, so talk to me. Let's talk about solutions and people that are actually working towards, you know, some positive, actionable change and yes. trying to do things for this cause. So you were saying that you worked for, you were volunteering for, um, what was the name of the organization? Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. It is the largest uh and oldest continuously operating rape crisis center in the country. It's a great place. I love it. Makes me very happy. Um, yeah, it's a great place. And how long have you been there? I've been a volunteer with them since 2012. Nationally, are there any organizations that people could know about that are maybe trying to support this issue and trying to uh, work towards some good things for it? Yeah, Know Your Nine, and Nine is spelled I X like title nine okay. um they're a great organization um and they work specifically as you might guess um with those who are trying to work on campus uh trying to help um assert their title nine rights um they have a lot of great resources um they can help with, both with uh if you want to like spread information like with a campaign as well as if you want to read up on what your actual rights are um they're very helpful that's know your nine i x and no is like K N O W. Right. So I guess kind of now we're in a wait and see pattern then, more or that less. That we are. Until we see what the official, you know, word is from Miss DeVos as it comes down with actual yeah. little permanent guidelines after the comment period, which should be, you know, as any comment period is with anything these days, rather eventful. The other thing that folks can do in the meantime, though, um, is that the interesting thing about rescinding these guidelines is that any college or university nationwide can choose to simply uphold the Obama era guidelines. Right. Um, and it's completely up to them. And so uh, if you are a current student or you're an alumni or you work at a university or you have any tie to a university at all, if you live in an area like me where there's a lot of universities there and you're a member of that community, um, you can reach out to those universities that you have some sort of tie to and you can let those presidents know, you can let those alumni know, you can even reach out to those Title IX officers and you can reach out to those people and say, listen, I am not in support of the rescinding of this letter. I am in support of the Dear Colleague letter, the Obama era protections, and I support survivors. And I think you should too. Um, and particularly if you are an alum, you will hit them where it hurts, hit them in the wallet, um, because unfortunately, <laughs> money is what talks. Uh, Delia, thank you for joining us and talking to us about all the Title IX stuff. Obviously, very important, and obviously, very close to your heart, and uh, obviously, Everyone should be concerned about this. So we'll keep an eye on it and we'll wait for, uh, you know, Betsy DeVos to, you know, come down from the mountaintop and tell us what she's thinking and what they're going to put down on paper for actual guidelines. Uh, so until we get that, I guess we're kind of just uh, waiting. Good time. Yeah, we'll see what she comes up with on her uh, on her private jet that she apparently pays for, which, you know, good for her. That's but, uh well, that's a thing. At least she's paying for it, may- and not not us. That, yeah, that's the new. That's maybe the new she thing. can pay for uh, some survivor's therapy bills while she's at it. All right. So, Delia, what else do you have going on? Because I know that you have things going on all the time. What else is happening in the world of Delia Harrington? Um, coming up this fall, I'm going to be reviewing episodes of Arrow for Den of Geek. So that's exciting. Um, I just had an essay go up today on the Mary Sue about my feelings on Joss Whedon and Buffy, Mm -hmm. um, which people have controversial feelings about because of what's been going on with Joss Whedon lately. So if people want to read that. How are are things at the Boston Healthcare for the homeless program going? Because I know that's. That's Things the- have been going great. Um, I, I've been writing a lot and I'm going to have a whole bunch of things that are coming. They're coming out, get this, in the mail what? because we are a real organization. We are doing things in print. So that's what I'm doing. That's awesome. Yeah. And hopefully um, podcast fans, you'll be here. You'll be literally hearing a lot more from me soon. Um, I don't know if we can say much Let's more say than it. that. You but. Can say it. We're going to do a Harlots podcast. 
I'm very excited for this. Did I sound more excited about that? No, you couldn't. But uh, I'm I'm really excited about it just because of you and uh, the other person who is involved. Which we'll we'll keep that on the down low, just in case. I'm just afraid to. I'm I'm so nervous. That's why no I didn't sound more excited. Right. <laughs> I'm afraid to say it. Uh, I'm excited because I love that show. I don't think enough people have watched it or heard about it or loved it, and I just get excited to share things and that I love. It is people. one of those shows where every time I hear somebody, they're kind of like you. It's anybody that's watched that show is like, have you watched Harlots? Oh my God, I love Harlots. And like everybody, <laughs> I've, I've never heard anything negative about it at all. So I think it's just one of those like flying under the radar shows that just needs to get a little more exposure. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. And so I don't know that anybody cares about this as much as Justin cares about this, but um, the way that we're, we're keeping it in the family, it's going to be a, a Harlots podcast that is like, I don't know. I don't know how it how it's like son of daughter of mayday podcast i don't know <laughs> it's i like that i like that offspring yeah. of mayday i think we're gonna phrase yeah. it mayday, well, like mayday, you... mayday presents i think like it's a, like it like yeah a i like that i like that mayday we're workshopping it there you go <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so this has been Mayday, the Handmaid's Tale podcast. I'm Justin. That was Delia. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And don't forget to check out our radio station, Handmaid's Resistance Radio. It is on Slacker Radio. You can use the Slacker app available at any app store, Google Play Store, or the App Store. Uh, it's Handmaid's Resistance Radio. You can go to slacker.com and listen. It's all free. Uh, it features all the music from the show. Uh, everything you wanted to hear from the show and it also features awesome music from awesome bands and artists uh, music of resistance rebellion inspiration and just great stuff so please go check that out once again handmaid's resistance radio that is on slacker radio also available with the slacker app